Let's find out if our next guest, Speaker Pro Tem, <laughs> Delegate Paul Espinosa, has rank in his own household. Paul, good morning to you. Uh, good morning. Good to be with you. Uh, hey, I know where I rank in our household. Yeah, see? Uh, it's not Admiral. <laughs> <laughs> swabby. He's a swabby, Bill. <laughs> He's just a bootstrapping swabby. Uh, Paul, um, well, welcome back to the Eastern Panhandle, by the way. Well, Hello. Great, great, two weeks? great to be back. Hey, first things first here, uh, Kathy. <laughs> Uh, speaking of rank, uh, uh, our, our commanding officer in the Espinosa household, <laughs> Kathy, uh, made some peanut butter fudge. So uh, she oh uh, asked me to make sure that each of the co-hosts Huge. got some. And if I could call Colin in here for a second. Oh, Colin, yeah. can you join us in here for a second? Sports doctor getting something, too? All right. Colin's going to get something, all right. So. <laughs> Sports doctor gets forgetting the lot. So, Colin, the uh, my wife Kathy really got a chuckle when I was umpiring the other evening, and you were commenting about uh, – an umpire without glasses on and so oh this is gonna be good and so uh so here's a special batch of fudge for you. it might say x-lax on the bottom but just ignore that little well it's a good there. thing i gave them sweets for lunch so i can't have these for another few weeks and, okay we'll say but i appreciate that. But anyway, it but yeah it was you good you, you so, the so Sunday he, he was umpiring the softball game <laughs> i thought it was him only saw about half his face and i'm like it looked like it was delegate espinosa but he didn't have his glasses on so then he turned around a few innings later. I'm like, I was correct. That is Paul Espinosa, but he fooled me because he didn't have his glasses on. And then Dylan decided to make the joke. So you're telling me the umpire's not wearing his glasses, <laughs> yeah. and that's where it went downhill. But you did save it. You said, well, maybe he's wearing contacts, which I do wear contacts yep. when I'm umpiring, so. just because of rain and dust and everything. It's a whole lot easier not to yeah, have the old glasses. Especially so. dusty there, yeah. Jefferson. Yeah. So appreciate well, the. How was the strike zone without yeah. the glasses there, Colin? It was great. I don't oh. think anybody complained during the game. Well, you had good, two good pitchers. You had Washington exactly. and Jefferson, and uh, they just threw strike after strike. They, towards the end of the game, they were definitely trying to expand the strike zone, both pitchers, and I was trying to rein them, <laughs> rein them in just a little bit. But it uh, was another pitcher's duel. Uh, ended up uh, being 2-1 to one Jefferson, and I think they play again Friday night. I don't know if you all have that game or another game this Friday. but I believe uh, they do, but I don't know if we have that on the but anyway, or not. Uh, Two of the two of the top teams. Uh, is, this, is this the year of the pitchers locally? Well, uh, I tell you, there is a lot of good pitching, and again, we're talking about high school softball, f- uh, fast pitch softball. Mm-hmm. Um, Hedgesville has a couple of nice, uh, relatively young pitchers, a couple of freshmen who both throw the ball very well. Um, the other night, Washington played Martinsburg, and you know, typically, you know, Martinsburg's uh, kind of in that rebuilding uh, phase. There, uh, a little less experienced team, although they do have some nice uh, young players. Uh, Washington pitched, uh, and I can't remember the young lady's name. Uh, their number two pitcher, uh, I think she's either a freshman or a sophomore. Uh, threw some nice rise ball, so I'm very encouraged with not only some of the current stars uh, of the game here locally but there there is some nice uh, young talent coming up which obviously bodes well for uh, for the next few years so talk a little bit about your career as an umpire i mean i think i knew this in a former life but but maybe forgot so um well uh of course when when our children were young and played uh youth ball both baseball and then later softball out at summit point uh, baseball league uh, after I finished my career as coaching once uh, Paul Jr. <laughs> yeah. once, once he uh, he kind of wrapped up his uh, his time in Bambino and then Cal Ripken league uh, you know several of us had always you know kind of helped out umpiring occasionally sure. you know if an umpire didn't show up or they've got to schedule an umpire you know one of the coaches would step in and so I kind of enjoyed it and then after again after Paul uh, graduated from the program a couple of us decided to actually get certified as Babe Ruth officials, and uh, I think we were scheduled to host, Summit Point was scheduled to host a tournament, and so several of us got certified, and we hosted our first district tournament out there, and then from districts, uh, I'm, I was fortunate to be able to move on to officiate uh, state tournaments, both Cal Ripken and Babe Ruth softball. Um, did uh, several regionals, and then actually was for, very fortunate to officiate seven uh, Babe Ruth softball and or Cal Ripken World Series uh, uh, tournament. So, wow, that's, you're that's what, like the big deal. Well, man. I don't know about all that, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, I, that that was my primary involvement. And then probably it's been about I think 11 years ago, I was approached about uh, officiating high school softball. Uh, just always, you know, a challenge to get more umpires, and so I was sure. asked to do that. And so. 
uh, began officiating about 11 years ago. Thought I was going to probably hang it up around COVID. You know, once mm-hmm, once the season mm-hmm. got got canceled to COVID, I thought, you know, this is probably a good time to maybe hang it up. But unfortunately, uh, like a lot of sports today, and I'm sure Rob, you're very aware of this too, being involved in in high school sports. You're just not getting new officials come out like yeah. you used to. You're losing. A lot of us are aging out, but you're just not getting new officials. So I still try to officiate some. Um, kind of keeps me out of the lazy boy and uh, gets gets me a little activity. Uh, one time I was asked uh, uh, several years ago uh, how I managed to actually – be able to get elected and reelected when I'm be, when I'm an umpire and I, and and I thought about it for a second. I said, well, perhaps uh, folks would rather me be down in Charleston than calling balls and strikes. So, so maybe that's the answer as to yeah. why I keep getting elected, so yeah. that uh, I'm not behind the plate. Maybe so. Paul, you mentioned uh, the lady uh, throwing a rice ball. Many of us are more familiar with men's baseball than women's softball. What are some of the pitches you, that you see? Well, of course, of course, uh, you know you have the you have the typical fastball. You have several pitchers here that can throw uh, screw balls. So, uh, you know they'll kind of you know spin. They'll start off in the strike zone and then start to spin either out or in. Uh, uh, pitchers that can throw a really good changeup, uh, if they if they can get command of that changeup. Uh, that that's an awesome pitch, and you got to really set it up, just as you do the rise ball. Uh, the I think the most effective use of a changeup or a rise ball, uh, a rise ball being a ball that kind of starts off looking like it's going to be right down the middle, and then just yeah, literally rises up out of the strike zone. You have to be able to set that up uh, effectively. You have to be able to get the early strike uh, or maybe two strikes to where the batter is inclined to swing at something swing that looks like it's yeah. going to be in the strike yeah. zone. And then you throw that, that change up or a rise ball. So those are kind of the, yeah. the main pitches that you kind of see. And How we about, are very fortunate. We've got yeah. a number of pitchers that are not just pitching during the regular season. I mean, they've got coaches. Uh, they're putting in a lot of time uh, to uh, master those pitches. What about sliders and curveballs? Curveballs, oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 And I think some of them look a little like a slider. Yeah. You know, there's uh, – there's a lot of different nuances yeah, there in the yeah. pitches. So, Paul Espinosa is our guest. We're talking softball here on, on the program. And then, well, by the way, while you were talking softball, the numbers were rising on our Facebook counter in terms of viewers. So just keep that softball talk going. Keep going. Keep going. For, yeah. for like, a moment, thank goodness we don't have to talk politics yeah, anymore. Yeah, no so. legislative stuff. You almost became my hero a couple of minutes ago when you were talking about young Paul coming through the system. Then you said, and then Bambino. And I'm thinking, you mean Paul named one of his kids Bambino? <laughs> Bambino Espinosa? That's awesome. Well, but it turned out you were just talking about the league. The youth league, uh, before it got named after Cal Ripken, it was yeah. also no, it was actually known as the Bambino League in, uh, in uh, Babe Ruth uh, baseball. But so. think about this, though. You're probably not having any more children at this age. I'm not sure what Paul's situation is. But at some point along the way, somebody in the family line has to name their kid Bambino now. There you go. Well, it's a great name. I'm not sure that's going to happen. <laughs> you work on it. Just saying. <laughs> Colin, it falls to you if nobody in the Espinosa family makes this move. But I have still more of an Irish name, even though I'm part Italian. I, I don't like know if it will roll off the tongue quite as nicely. Bambino but. McLaughlin. I, I, I think I still like it. Bambino, Bambino Lawrenson. It works. You, I don't you think. got possibilities with grandchildren yeah, yeah, yeah. here. Right? Yeah. Well, Colin, uh, uh, all joking aside, great job on the coverage. Uh, Thank you. I, I know it makes for long days. And, uh, you know, Rob, I know you're well. Uh, but not well, softball, though. You too. get a good pitch softball game, you're out of there in an hour or so. Well, that's very fortunate. matter of fact, my the first uh, game that I officiated back with Jimmy Pearson, who was a long-time oh, yeah. official in the area of mm-hmm. football, uh, uh, softball, uh, he he uh, he's the one actually who approached me and asked me if I would consider officiating high school softball. So, you know, he wore me down, and uh, so we're out there. We're officiating our first game at Jefferson High School. And you know the softball field is back sort of behind the uh, baseball field there. And uh, we wrap up our game, and uh, we're walking towards our car, and, and Jimmy turns to me and says, Paul, you know what the best part of officiating girls' softball is? And I said, no, what is that, Jimmy? And he said, look, look over there at the baseball field. They're in the fourth inning. Yep. We're getting paid the same as them, and we're headed to our car. You know, so and that's, uh, I loved calling girls. Uh, Two of the best pitchers I ever saw in this area, Tabby Mercurio oh, yeah. from Martinsburg, and I think her name was Jordan Lopez 
from Jefferson High School back in the 90s. Wow. That's Both were just my time. dynamite. Well, I just, I really wasn't involved in the high school scene at yeah. that mm-hmm. point. But, uh, that was, uh, so. I, I think Jordan was actually a catcher, I'm sorry, but okay. she was a great softball player. So um, when my kids were um, thinking about sports, it was very controlled on my part because it was what what sports have a beginning time and an end time. So we went with soccer and basketball because you have a prescribed amount of time. And I can remember Will, you know, when he was teeny tiny, doing the whole, you know, let's do some baseball and everything. And I was kind of like, oh my gosh, you could be there for like four hours. You could be there a while um, in baseball. <laughs> and I don't have four hours of patience to, <laughs> to sit there through. And my kids will attest that I'm a pretty vocal fan I know you might find that hard to believe. I, I do. You're competitive. Um, that's a shock, Maria. I'm pretty competitive, and basketball was way worse than than soccer because it was inside. So anyway, well, that's one of the reasons why I started public address announcing at ball games when when uh, our daughter started playing basketball uh, mm. in uh, middle school. Studio with Bill and Maria and Speaker Pro Tempore. Don't forget Paul Espinosa. Paul, let's let's get into politics here. Paul and politics in a little bit here. Uh, first and foremost, you, you know, obviously, with as an umpire, you know the SSAC intimately, <laughs> and there was some movement made by the legislature to have some oversight regarding the SSAC this year. Has that been passed, signed by the governor, and such? So I don't know. Uh, after when the legislature is not in session, uh, it's I think each of you are aware the governor has 15 days, uh, not uh, including Sundays in order to act on legislation. So I haven't actually looked to see about that legislation. I actually, I'm trying to think whether I was a co-sponsor or not, but I was certainly supportive of the legislation that would have allowed our homeschoolers, uh, those students involved in micropods, uh, those (coughs) micro schools to participate in sports. They'd have to follow all the same rules that other students would would have to follow. They'd also have to, if they wanted to participate, it would have to be at a school within their district, and it would be uh, with the proviso that that sport is not offered at their school. So if, if their school offered basketball or football, they couldn't you know, jump over to, uh, to the traditional high school sports. Uh, the Senate had a piece of legislation that allowed a one-time transfer, and frankly, I don't know all the details of that particular bill. It was never taken up by the House, just because I think, in talking, you know, with a lot of our colleagues, th- there were some folks that were very much in favor of that uh, of that Senate legislation. There were others that had some big concerns, including myself. I just wasn't sure how that would. So really that work. did not pass. Well, then, Paul? so this is okay. this is what happens at the end of the okay. session. Uh, <laughs> the Senate uh, often has a little bit more lax interpretation of whether an amendment is germane or not meaning okay is it really relevant to the to the bill uh that's before them and so we sent over our bill that would have solely addressed the issue of whether homeschoolers microschoolers micropod students could play sports they amended in the provisions of the bill that would allow the one-time transfer so it came back over to the house. I think it was either on the last night or the next, the next, the last night. And so our members were faced with a decision here: Do we, you know, ex- hold our nose and accept the Senate amendment, including the the transfer, the one-time transfer provision, uh, or or not? And I actually voted against uh, the amendment, uh, meaning I didn't want to concur with the Senate amendment. I wanted to send our bill back to the Senate with the request that they recede from their uh, amendment and just pass our bill. But uh, the majority of our members did uh, support, or at least were willing to hold their nose and support the amendment by the by the Senate. So that's the way the bill ultimately passed with both provisions: the 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 micro school and homeschool provision, as well as the one time transfer. I I can look it up here probably in a second, maybe during our next break to see. But I'm very curious because the the governor, obviously, you know, he has uh, some firsthand experience in in sports being a uh, a, a current uh, high school uh, girls basketball coach, uh, formerly a a boys basketball coach. Kind of curious. Uh, I think the WVSACC, as I understand it, I think they were lobbying against the bill because of that 
transfer provision that was inserted into the bill. Um, some coaches were advocating for a veto. Others were saying, no, we like it. So it'll be really interesting to see how the governor comes down on that particular The measure. governor has veto power, which can be overridden by a simple majority, but does he have line item veto power? Only in the case of uh, of the budget or, you know, a, okay. a, a budgetary, a supplemental appropriation. He has line item veto. So if there's a number, he doesn't like the fact that we're uh, allocating, you know, $500 million, he could line item veto that uh, and, and make it a smaller number. Uh, not so with other legislation. It's either approve it or veto it. You can also do a pocket veto, meaning that if you don't, if he doesn't act on it within the 15 days uh, after, you know, after the bill's passed, uh, when we're not in session, he can basically just do nothing and the bill becomes law without mm -hmm. a signature. I think there was one bill so far that was dealing with uh, tax increment financing that for some reason uh, he decided to pocket veto, meaning that it became law. He just he decided not to sign it. When the House and Senate are getting to the final point of a law that uh, they'd like to pass on to the governor's office, do you reach out to the governor's contacts to find out if it's a bill he would sign? There's a regular conversation, you know, almost constant conversation with the governor's staff you know, throughout the legislative session. If there is a bill that we have strong suspicions that the governor may not approve, uh, then typically we will try to pass those bills earlier in the session uh, so that uh, during the session, the governor has five days in order to act on the legislation, again, not including Sundays. Um, so that's a way of just ensuring that, you know, while we're in session, there is an opportunity to revisit that, to override the governor's veto, if you will, because it, it does just simply require a simple majority. Now, to the governor's credit, uh, he pretty much signs everything that we've sent him over the last, well, particularly since he's been a Republican governor. Uh, he's been much more cooperative. And uh, with occasionally there'll be technical vetoes. There'll be something to where, you know, he and his staff are looking through a bill and there'll be something in there that is just a, a technical error. And so sometimes you'll see, and you'll, I'm, I'm sure despite all the best efforts of our, of our council and staff are looking very carefully to help avoid technical vetoes, I'm sure there will probably be at least a few technical vetoes where the governor you know, or his staff will say, you know, hey, I would have supported this bill, but I can't sign it because of this. If you will fix it, uh, either during an upcoming special session, if it's something that's, you know, uh, of time sensitive, the governor would consider offering it during a, like a, a brief special session when we're down in Charleston for interims, or you know, recon you know, uh, fix this, address this, and I'll be happy to sign it, uh, you know, during the next legislative session. Paul, at this time of year, you, you're back in your home districts, and there's going to be a lot of folks, and you did a great job. There's going to be some folks said you, you strayed off the reservation. We occasionally see a score uh, scoreboard uh, or the – members uh, have been scored by various organizations how many of these scoring organizations are there around well i think there's quite a quite a few and i think i think since uh, the initial advent uh, of of some of those scorecards by a few organizations i think other organizations that are advocating legislation have gotten into that game and you know they'll try to they'll put out the word that hey this is going to be a scored vote you know yeah. uh, think hard yeah. about this thing thing I frankly, I just that is not not something that I've ever really given a whole lot of thought to. I mean, I'm I've always tried to focus, and I think most of my colleagues really try to focus on is the legislation good legislation or not? Because there is some legislation which, if you look at the title of it, it seems like a really really good bill. Uh, back when I was in the minority, my first term, we frankly introduced a, a fair amount of legislation that we knew would never see the light of day. And uh, it probably really wasn't sound legislation as far as does, would, the, would the legislation really work if it became law. We had the benefit of that because we were in the minority. We yeah. knew that it was pretty much just messaging legislation. Yeah. Since 2015, since we've been the majority, you have to make sure that if this bill actually becomes law, and chances are if, if our caucus – once a bill, it's going to become law, assuming that we can get the Senate to go along and, and the governor to sign it. Uh, 
but it's that's not sufficient. A bill has to really be good legislation, and you have to work out the details. And so uh, some legislation, even though an advocacy group may be pushing it, if the details of it, if how it would really work in, 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 in actual practice is not sound, uh, I have no problem voting against a bill and, and letting those groups know that, hey, if if you had, you know, helped draft a piece of legislation that would actually work as opposed to just being a poorly written piece of legislation, then I'd be happy to support it. And so I've never really worried too much about that bill. I, I try to focus on, yeah. is it really a good piece of legislation or not? So the message I'm hearing from you is that we as a uh, voter, uh, if we look at a scorecard, we should dig a little bit deeper and see who the sponsor is and what what they're advocating before we put too much credence in a particular scorecard. I think that's fair. Uh, Americans for Prosperity, I, mean, I, I, I find myself fairly aligned to a lot of their uh, legislation just philosophically. However, there's there have been more than a few occasions, well, I, I would say, let me just say a few occasions, you know, two or three, where uh, I noticed that they scored me, you know, on the wrong side of a particular issue where I think if I actually had opportunity to sit down with them and say, listen, I, I think I actually had the conservative perspective yeah. on this, and this is why. Uh, this particular legislation, even though the title sounded good, these were some of the flaws of the bill. I think they might rethink that. But again, it's just a scorecard. It's just a guide. Again, I'm happy to explain and own any of my votes that I make. Yeah. Uh, for going into this session, uh, everybody recognized there was a mega supermajority with the Republicans. And with that number of that size majority, you're bound to have factions. And one of the factions that showed up fairly early was a Brandon Steele challenge against uh, the, the speaker. Uh, did that group, I think there's around 32 or 33, did that group for, hold together during the session uh, and as kind of a counter to what a lot of the stuff that the speaker wanted to do? I think by and large, we were able to move past the speaker's race fairly well. And I early on uh, actually uh, reached out to Brandon. Uh, he and I spoke, uh, spoke with uh, Jeff Foster, who was vice chair, Brandon Steele's, uh, Chairman Steele's vice chair when, when uh, Delegate Steele chaired a uh, government organization. And, you know, I made very clear to them. I said, listen, you know, this does not have to be a death sentence for you guys. I mean, let's move on. Uh, you, you both are, are way too talented. Uh, I really appreciate your perspective on legislation. Jeff Foster, Delegate Foster from Putnam County, I don't think anybody works harder than him as far as really scrutinizing legislation, making sure that, again, that is really truly sound legislation, comes up with proposed amendments that can actually improve a bill. And I, and I just tried to, I implored them both. I said, listen, uh, you know, let's let's move beyond this. Let's continue to work together just as we have in the past because your talents are, 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 are desperately needed. If, if, you, if you guys will be constructive, uh, we'll all be the better for it. And I think for the most part, I think, uh, I think those folks uh, did that. And, and I think the speaker sent that same message to folks that, listen, realize that in a speaker's race, some people are going to be on the winning side, some people are going to be on the losing side, but... Uh, we, we all need each other to work together, and I think by and large, I think we did that. It's very early in the game, and I appreciate that. A lot's going to happen in the next year and a half or so. But do you know, have you been hearing fairly consi uh, persistently of certain members not running again for re-election? Well, uh, not surprisingly, uh, you know, we're starting to see some of our yeah. members express interest in, in other offices. Uh, I think I saw Delegate Chris Pritt. Uh, who uh, whose district is down in the Kanawha Valley in the Charleston area. I think uh, just yesterday or the day before he announced that he's planning to run for, for Secretary of State, obviously with uh, Secretary of State uh, Mac Warner uh, putting his hat in the in the ring for the governor's race. Uh, that, that provides an opportunity. Uh, so I know Chris is there. Um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, Treasurer Moore, you know, he's uh, filed for for Congress, uh, who, who I'm certainly uh, supportive of his his race there. A number of legislators are, you know, I, I hear talks or or, are you, or they've shared with me that they're considering some other races. Uh, Delegate Caleb Hanna, 
I believe he's filed for or expressed an interest in running for state auditor with uh, J.B. McCuskey also seeking the governor's mansion. So I think there'll be a lot of uh, musical chairs yeah. here <laughs> over the next uh, yeah. coming months. Yeah. Good. So, so what? Um, this is something that I've asked uh, uh, folks who've come in when we when Bill and I have been here. Um, what piece of legislation that passed? Um, not were you most proud of, but were you happiest about? And then conversely, what were you most disappointed in? Yeah, the second one's probably a little tougher. I'll need to think about that one a little bit more. I'm sure I can think of something, but tax uh, reform is is probably the big one. You know, if you look, uh, Maria, at what we've accomplished, you know, since we took the majority in 2015, I mean, the uh, the list is pretty extensive, and I think I, I would argue very impressive as to what we've done. Uh, and I think a lot of the economic development we're seeing, the the looks that we're getting from uh, quality job creators, I think is an affirmation of some of the policies that we put in place. Uh, place whether you know right to work, regulatory reform, uh, other legal reform. But tax reform is, was probably the one big area that I know I and uh, a number of us. Uh, yeah, you know, we're still uh, a little disappointed that we hadn't quite gotten that across the finish line. And I think going into this session, uh, you know, in the in the aftermath of the Amendment Two failure, uh, despite the fact that the House, the Senate, and the Governor all had expressed support for uh, tax relief, uh, tax cuts, uh, that was, I think, the big fear of mine, and I think others that despite all that agreement that we need to, you know, uh, provide some, some meaningful tax relief, I think there was a real opportunity for, you know, the train to go off the tracks this session. Because again, there was still a lot of personal uh, hurt feelings, I think. Uh, obviously the governor coming out, despite the fact that he had uh, advocated sure. for, you know, some v version of a, a reduction in the tax on business equipment and inventory, uh, during I think at least three state of the state addresses, uh, and then coming out in urging rejection of Amendment Two, I think that particularly uh, for our Senate colleagues was a a very bitter pill to swallow. And I just I was very concerned going into the session that, you know, can we can we repair that damage soon enough to avoid just uh, loggerheads, you know, throughout the legislative session. And to start off with, I think there was definitely, uh, <laughs> some of that, that we were, that was at play, just some of the meetings that I, I was involved in, uh, some of the early negotiations with, uh, Senate leadership, as well as the governor and the governor's staff, it was pretty clear that amendment two was still a big issue. And I was just, again, was very, uh, fearful that that was, we just weren't going to be able to get past get that, past but, <laughs> but fortunately we were. And I think to be able to pass more than $750 million of tax relief that arguably is going to benefit almost all working West Virginians, as well as those that you know, own personal vehicles. Uh, I mean, that, that is huge. Uh, the fact that we've uh, been able to, uh, make some some desperately needed reforms in our public employee insurance program to help ensure that we're actually going to have a solvent program that's that's usable by our employees as opposed to being increasingly rejected by providers i think that was really huge uh, uh passing i think what our fourth or fifth uh state employee pay raise i mean that was huge dn uh, dhr dhhr that reorg which i think will make that uh uh, BMF, you know, agency just, you know, much more, you know, understandable and it, it'll help us to hopefully drive more accountability there. I think all those things were huge, huge uh, uh, wins this, this session. I think as far as things that uh, this is something that didn't quite make it past the finish line. Uh, one thing that I've advocated for the last couple sessions, and we just haven't been able to get it through the House, the Senators have passed it, is legislation to reform our unemployment insurance pr program. Uh, I'm concerned based on the discussions I've had with our workforce West Virginia folks that if we don't make some adjustments as to how we're uh, administrating our unemployment insurance program, uh, there may be some solvency issues down the road. And one of the things that we've seen other states start to do is to make reforms to make sure that we're not 
uh, providing a disincentive for folks to enter the workforce. Sadly, West Virginia, uh, we I think all know here at this table, uh, does have the lowest workforce participation rate in the country. These are folks that are able-bodied, able to you know uh, enter the workforce, but for whatever reason are not in the workforce. I think our current unemployment insurance program does provide some level of disincentive for folks to enter the workforce. Legislation that I co-sponsored in the House and that did pass out of the Senate would do a couple things. One, it would have um, it would have indexed unemployment uh, coverage so that when an unemployment rates are low, uh, there's fewer weeks available for unemployment insurance. When unemployment is higher, uh, folks would get more unemployment uh uh, coverage, more weeks of coverage. The other, uh, I think, really uh, nice feature of that proposed legislation is that it would have encouraged folks that uh, perhaps uh, were out of work to take an interim position that's perhaps not their forever job, but take an interim job without losing their benefits. Uh, there would have been a provision, because we would have indexed the weeks of coverage, that would have helped pay for. Uh, providing an employee that they would be able to keep their interim pay without losing their unemployment benefits. And that, again, just gets people back into the workforce actively, uh, not only working, but still in a much better position to look for that forever job uh, uh, than they have today. So that was probably the one piece of legislation that I was disappointed uh, didn't pass. But with everything that we did pass, I mean, it's just... uh, I'm happy to lose that bill, uh, considering what all we accomplished this session. Paul, picking up on what Maria asked a second ago, uh, you and your fellow legislators have taken a lot of credit for the t- uh, income tax reduction. Ken Apple was on the other day, and he would argue that for a lot of the a lot of the folks, fixing the marriage penalty would have been a better better return to the taxpayer than what you did yet there was no effort to fix the marriage penalty and it probably will not be because of all the triggers you have in the future it's going to continually be pushed down the uh, on the horizon uh how would you address the fact that this probably would have been more significant but yet it was not addressed well I, i'm a big fan of ken apple as i suspect all of you are i mean i mm-hmm. always uh, appreciate his counsel and have had had very similar discussions. And uh, would I have preferred to try to address that marriage penalty? Absolutely. Um, But first and foremost, I wanted to get some meaningful tax relief across the finish line. And I think uh, sometimes I think it's very easy to get fixated on one approach. And again, I'm not I'm, I'm not casting aspersions on on Ken, because again, I really respect his perspective. And Perhaps it would have been something that would, I think an early version, I think, of the Senate plan would have tried to address that that issue. Uh, I think uh, probably either Senator Tarr or uh, President Blair, uh, perhaps uh, Delegate Householder or, or uh, House Finance Chair Vernon Chris could speak to why that was ultimately removed. I think there were some issues or it added some complexity perhaps that they just couldn't get resolved in the limited time that we had. but. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, uh, I was, uh, when, when people ask me, and I think you all ask me, what do you prefer? I mean, I passed, I, I, I voted for the, the uh, personal income tax relief, uh, the governor's plan early on in the session. Uh, could I have voted for the Senate plan that it introduced? Uh, yes, I could have. Uh, were there parts of each that I didn't like, you know, fully? Uh, absolutely. But I was most uh, committed in... Um, working towards let's get some meaningful uh, uh, tax relief across the finish line this session. Uh, let's not uh, allow the good to be the enemy of the perfect uh, or, or, or vice versa yeah. there. Uh, and so, but I think it's something that we need to address. I think also the uh, the deductions, the, the kind of the standard deductions, I think that's something that clearly uh, we probably need to address. Uh, it's been a while since we've addressed some of those and uh, uh, 
But but I I respect but, Ken's uh, perspective. Yeah, some of the, someone said on the show that the reason you did not address it was because of money dollars, and if you carried that forward and with the triggers that are in place, uh, you're going to be continually reducing the t- uh, the the percent of tax income tax reduction. It implies to me that the marriage penalty, if it is going to be fixed, is going to be fixed a long time in the future. Yeah, uh, I would encourage you uh, to, uh, w- next time that uh, uh, Majority Leader Householder is on, uh, he's probably in a much better position mm-hmm. to address the whole question of those triggers. Uh, again, while I fully respect yeah. Ken, mm-hmm. I don't think Ken quite had uh, the triggers uh correct as far as the way that he understood there i think in an earlier version of the bill i think what ken described was was the case okay. but the final version of the bill uh, uh delegate householder leader householder actually had a, a major role in drawing up those those triggers uh, i think he'd probably be the best person to explain exactly how those triggers work he, he's fairly confident that those triggers will actually result in some additional uh, tax relief yeah now and I applaud you folks. You did a lot of good. So I don't, my questions do not imply that you, it was a bust. It was just the opposite. You did a, I thought you had a great session. Uh, but the jail issues, paying our correction officials was one that was not addressed. Uh, will this be addressed in future sessions, in interim sessions, or what? I think absolutely. I'd say that probably is one of the big areas that, uh, you know, we, we were not able to get you know, the full uh, action on. I, I think one of the things that I think, I know at least in the House and perhaps the Senate, I think we were really looking to the governor to give us a plan. I mean, because this is something that I think the governor and his staff, his Secretary of Homeland Security, really needs to come up with a comprehensive approach to how we address this. I mean, obviously we have enacted some additional pay for our correctional uh, employees uh, over uh, the last few years. Of course, they received the um, the um, the twenty three hundred dollar pay. Despite one of the comments I saw in the mm-hmm. uh, in the in the uh, comments there, uh, it's it's actually not a wash uh, for uh, all, all but all but the highest earners in West Virginia. Yeah. Uh, they still will sign- see a significant pay raise uh, of that twenty three hundred dollars. A, a a relatively small portion of the $2,300 will go to the additional uh, premium Cost increase the there. Exactly. Add to that, the again, the uh, uh, the fact that uh, we did a 700, more than $750 million tax cut. I think folks are across West Virginia are gonna more than make out, make out on that. And just an additional aside there, I will just point out that I can appreciate some of the angst by state employees, you know, to see their premiums increase, but frankly, they're starting to experience what virtually every Everybody. other person in the country has experienced. When you realize that over the last 12 years, premiums have not increased virtually at all in our state employee program. I defy you to find any insurance program in the country where premiums have not increased over 12 years. Now, is there pain associated with the PI increase? Yes. I think that uh, the cost of the uh, of the premium increase to employees is about twenty nine million dollars, but you offset that by one hundred and twenty million dollars of employee pay raise for state employees, and then the seven hundred and fifty million dollar tax cut. Uh, I think that's uh, still a, a, a clear uh, net uh, benefit there. Bill, could you remind me of your question, please? <laughs> I what well, I was talking specifically oh, about the, corrections. Uh, correction yeah. officers. So yes. I think yes. that uh, I. So my expectation <clears throat> is, uh, anticipation is, is that the governor will at some time when we're in uh, in interims uh, down in Charleston will bring to us and, and probably beforehand will bring to us a proposal as to how we can. Uh, you know, further address uh, the challenges that we're having and not only uh, attracting but retaining correction employees. So I would anticipate before next year's legislative session, we'll probably be in special session uh, yeah. to address uh, uh, a proposal from the governor. An expression which many of us had not really 
heard of or are, were experienced with has come to light a great deal this past session, and that's the front end of the budget and the back end of the budget. Right. And frequently, the a lot of these needed factors are pushed to the back end of the budget, and they are paid, but they're paid only dependent if there's a surplus or some additional information. So I assume that any uh, uh, addressing the correctional problems would be on the front end of the budget. Is that correct? That's right, uh, Bill. For, for the most part, any ongoing expenses, you typically, you know, because those are going to be ongoing expenses, like employee pay raises, for example, those are typically, they're, they're, they almost always are in the main body of the budget. What we have in the, when we refer to the back of the budget, that is the surplus section yes. of the budget. These are items that if there is a budget surplus uh, on June 30th of this year, after we close our fiscal year this year, if there is a surplus, these items will be funded in the order in which they appear in that surplus section of budget. Uh, with, I, I think without exception, those items that are in that surplus section are one type, uh, one time expenditures, infrastructure needs, for example, you know, providing funding for our colleges and universities, for example, to uh, 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 address uh, uh, deferred maintenance, other types of uh, projects such as that to where you know, these are, you know, one-time spending. It's very similar to county government where, you know, you really you really risk uh, putting yourself in, in a bad situation if you start putting, using one-time dollars for ongoing expenditures. Because what happens when those dollars go away? Then you're faced with the situation where you have to eliminate headcount, and that's not something you typically want to do, you know, in the back of the budget. It's mostly for one-time expenditures yeah. to address things that we all know need to be done as far as upgrading infrastructure. Yeah, I was not talking about one-time expense. expense. Right. I was talking about a, in, a con, occurring, continually occurring, such as pay uh, pays. That's, like that's that. almost, uh, without exception, yeah. that would be in the main body yeah. Yeah. of the budget. I was, um, I was taken back when we were talking about those one-time expenses back to a time when the, the um, Hollywood casinos money went to local entities and everybody was going to use it for infrastructure and nobody was going to use it for personnel. And guess what? That yeah. just generally doesn't happen. People have to be really um, careful about that. Your position as Speaker Pro Tem is... Was this your first year doing that, or your okay? It's my first official. Okay, uh, talk about that. There. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and you've got like thirty One seconds. Yeah. One minute. <laughs> okay. Well, it's uh, as I think I shared previously. I did have an opportunity during last uh, the previous session, right. to just fill in informally when the right. both the speaker and the speaker pro tem were both out sick. Mm -hmm. uh, I was next up, and so I, I did preside. Yeah, we saw you on the last night. Mike's like, isn't that Paul Espinosa? And. Uh, uh, I, I, <laughs> I was I was uh, very uh, fortunate to be able to preside on several occasions. One time, the speaker just was under the weather, and I think we had eighty bills on the calendar that day, and uh, and we got through it, and uh, and it went well. And actually, the governor uh, asked me. I think it was on the last day. He said, "Paul, I really need to go over to the Senate to help negotiate this." Uh, the uh, teacher aides bill. He, that was a big priority of the speaker. He said, I'd like to go over to the Senate to help negotiate this. Will you fill in mm -hmm. so I can get That's over there? And, and I mm -hmm. was very pleased that he was. He felt comfortable enough yeah. to uh, leave me uh, presiding so that he could actually get that bill across the finish yeah. line, and we did. 